Welcome to the Stoke Bloke Show, peoples. I'm Barton Lynch. I am the Stoke Bloke. Joining me in the Pipeline Studios, courtesy of a New Earth Project, is Peter P.K. King. How are you, my friend? Very um, good. Welcome back. I heard you went to Australia. I did, mate. I got to go back to the homeland. They let you in. The home of my birth. I got to see my mum for the first time in three and a half years, and that was, that was so cool, mate, just to see mum and, and spend the night with her up there in Sydney. Did she recognise you? She did. She didn't like the look. Really? She looked at me and went, what is that? Get that stuff off your face. <laughs> oh, I don't like the beard, darling. I don't like the beard. And I said, well, it's lucky um, you don't have to live with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> my little brother was there and opened the door and I got to see him again for the first time, as with my mum, for three and a half years. Wow. And it was a sweet little moment. I only spent the night there with them. But my mum lives in a retirement village and the... I walk into the, to her place and immediately my nose gets, whew, something's a bit pongy in here. <laughs> something's not so good. I go to the bathroom and go, oh, it's in here that's not so good. And I suppose your cleaners come in and whiz through and don't pay any attention to what's going on. And I look at the toilet and go, oh, she's tomorrow morning I've got to hit that. And so I get up first thing the next day and I just go to work on my mum's bathroom because it is filthy and there's stuff caked up underneath the toilet seat and stuff that needs a chisel and a hammer to <laughs> dislodge it and I spend an hour in there really just cleaning the toilet because it was disgusting mate wow and then I, I, I you know I give my mum I do that clean I feel like I've been a good son I've cleaned the bathroom made the place you know tolerant tolerable I then go get in the taxi, go to the airport, get myself a chicken, bacon, avocado, panini. I meet Carlos, I sit down, I start eating it, and then I start to go, mm, what's that in my stomach? And my stomach doesn't feel so good. We get on the plane, we sit an hour on the tarmac, Jet star, mate, torture. Um, and my stomach starts going, and then the plane takes off, and I've, I know I've got another hour or so to survive. You think you got something from the fumes in the bathroom? Oh, I got some bacteria for sure, because next thing you know, we land. I'm checking that the paper bag's in the seat thing. I go, yep, okay, I'm ready oh, to go. No. And I'm against the window. And um, we get there, and I manage that. And then we get the bags, and we drag the bags through customs to the rent car place, and I just go, how hey, i got to go. So I'm outside in the garden, oh. <laughs> throwing up. They're all that. I have to I drive to Melbourne cross-eyed. I'm too scared to fart because we know don't know what's going to happen at that end of town <laughs> as it's coming out the front end. And so I was, was in a mess. It was an explosive situation. It was an explosive situation. Oh, I, I, I paid the price for being away for three and a half years from my mum. And um, I, it was either the chicken panini or it was the bacteria from the toilet cleaning and it not was wearing just gloves. Australia and, welcoming you back. Yeah, and I was sick as a dog for 48 hours. Where'd you guys stay down at Bell's? I know it can be a little spidery. Some well, of the uh, places. Were yeah, you in we, we were in a, or? No, we were uh, on in this side. Clean, of, oh, you're in the new area. In the new area. Over by the Rip Curl shop. Near the Sands Golf Course. Right, that right, kind okay. of area. Other side You'd of town. know that. Yep. Um, and we were there. We had a nice little place, just Carlos and I. Um, the Aussies, fantastic humans, mate. You know, not having been back for so long, you're not sure how the reception is, you know, especially with everything that's gone on and a position you've taken on everything. And everywhere I went... I just got such positive support from people just going, hey, thank you for staying true. Thank you for being you. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep saying what you're saying. We love it. And there was so much support for me personally in that sense and then around the commentary every day, mate, five, ten times a day. Everybody in Nelly I, I bumped into was, ah, oh, we miss you on the commentary, mate. When are you going to be back? Mate? Don't hold your breath, peoples. Well, you're um, right. You're right here. It's called the Stokes Bloke Show. Well, that's right. And there was a lot of positivity for the... Uh, podcast too people love what we're doing they love cool. what we were sharing and it was all in all it was great to go home and, and connect with with the mother country as they say how long till you got over that sickness it was a solid 48 and i was struggling mate you know i couldn't sort of wander too far from the lavatory <laughs> and i had to just kind of monitor what i was eating and i could barely eat and so it was you know it was a good 48 72 hours of not real good. But then we bounced back in time and, um, you know, we were ready for the competition. Carlos prepared well. Felt like we did everything in the lead up. So well. you were there again with Carlos Munoz. Yes. Coaching him really hands-on 
And how was the progress from, you know, event one to this one? Yeah, I mean, it's... He wasn't very organised in Portugal, was he? Fair to say hmm. that there was some forgetting a wetsuit, forgetting this, wrong fins, wrong board. And, you know, we, we made a point out of Portugal to go, hey, mate, you've got to get organised. No one succeeds being unorganised. That just doesn't happen. You've got to be organised. And the improvement in that, that side of things was fantastic. When we first got there, he spent a whole day getting all those boards ready. You know, deck pads on, stick it up, waxed up, leg rope ropes, right fins, everything, and all the equipment was tuned and ready. So that was a fantastic sort of platform to start from. Caught up with Kelly a bit down there, and um, he and Carlos ended up in the same heat again. And it was two events in a row where, where, where those guys were in the same heat. Uh, unfortunately for Carlos, he started that heat well and won the opening exchange. And then there was a period of about five mistakes in a row with priority, with wave selection, with patience, through the middle of that heat that kind of let Kelly get a lead. Kelly got a 6-3-3 and a 5-7-6 straight away. And um, Carlos has had a 4-8-3. And then uh, Conor O'Leary, he... he sort of just got into that heat with a... He got a 6-1 for two backhand turns and then got a little score that he needed, a four and a half, and Carlos needed a six and got potentially the best wave of the heat and belted this thing and got the five, high five, didn't get the score. And it was the next morning when I woke up to a text from Kelly and he said, hey, I just watched the heat. There's no way Kelly didn't get through that. I mean, uh, Carlos didn't get through that heat. And at that point, I was like, well, you know, and I've, I've been in that situation before where you feel like you might have been hard done by. And on social media, Carlos was getting heaps of comments about that from people. And it was a little, little storm blowing up around his scoring of his last ride. So we organised with the judges and the next day went down there and had a meeting with the head judge, Pratamo, and ran through the heat um, and they were, they're always good to do, you know, it's always a good thing to do to get that clarity. And he actually said, look, I wish I could tell you that we reviewed it and everybody thought we got it right. He said, but, you know, we reviewed it and upon review, half of them thought we got it right and the other half thought we might have got it wrong. What's that process like if you're a pro surfer and you feel that, okay, I want to know, I want some more clarity on this. I yeah. mean, let's just be honest, you, you think you got ripped off. Okay, so how do you approach the, the judging panel to have that meeting at... What's the protocol to set that up? I don't yeah. think a lot of people know that that's, that's something a possibility. That can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it happens quite a lot because one, the primary reason for doing it is to get clarity around your score, around the scoring, and know the way the judges saw it. Because it doesn't matter what I think. Sure. It doesn't matter what Carlos thinks. It matters what the judges think. And so really, rather than complaining, your job's to understand it. And so they make themselves available. We reached out to Renato Hickel, the tour manager. He organised a meeting, so Said, come down now, we're on, on a break, they were on a break, so we went down there and, and met and ran through it. They were willing to look through the, the whole video of the heat again with us, but it wasn't necessary because we've all seen it, so we just kind of talked in general, um, got some Was good there two feedback. waves you compared specifically? Well, I looked at, we looked at the 633 of Kelly's, the 576 of Kelly's, the 61 of Connors, the 45 of Connors, and then the, the two scores. All those five. scoring rides, and then tried to imagine where. Carlos's last ride fitted into that mix in terms of scores and it potentially was the best wave of that of that all of those high scoring rides and that was Kelly's opinion which kind of motivated me to kind of go and have that meeting with the judges because it was one of those ones where Carlos needed the experience of, of that kind of standing up for yourself and going down there and talking and I, I said to him before the, the objective of this meeting is not to get someone to admit they were wrong or do, it's just for us to understand so that you can be better and one thing Pratamo did say was that he felt like from a wave selection point of view he'd had some good finishes to waves some good starts to waves and and the reality was is that he hadn't put the whole package together onto the wave I feel like sometimes at the end of the heat let's say you need a score the judges love that and then the score they give you on your last wave is not necessarily an accurate reflection of a number. It gives them some wiggle room to say thumbs up or thumbs down on whether you did enough to win the heat. Yes. They, they get to just do this, and, and they could write 599 if you need a six, yeah. or they could write 6.1. That's right. But they get to just say, no, we thought Connor won. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know if that's true, but human nature 
is such that I think they really like that last moment opportunity. Like, Felipe got a score at the end of his heat, you know, and they get to say who goes through and who doesn't. That's where I was going to go is the Jackson Baker, Felipe Toledo heat. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the quarters, perhaps. And that Felipe hadn't caught a good wave. There weren't many good waves anyway. And Felipe, under priority, was catching anything in their non-priority section of their heat. And then in the heat, he just kept... He was ripping and he was surfing. He was turning waves that were threes and fours into sixes and scores. And it was like, whoa, he's ripping that hard. But because he was doing it on average waves, the, the door was open. And then Jacko, right at the end, he, he'd had an 8-5 Felipe, which was a sick one. And then Jacko got a 9 at the end, which was the wave. And then that, you know how he's been big and bold and powerful this year, Jackson Baker, don't you think? Like yes. on a wave, there's this presence and this energy and speed. We go, whoo, he's ripping. You know, he's surfing really well. And he maximised that wave, got the 9. Felipe's flipping out. He comes to the beach, he's looking at the judges going, what, a nine? A nine? What do you mean a nine? <laughs> and calling the judges out. And he needs the score. He's waiting on his last wave, which came in after the nine. He needs a seven. Do you think that's the appropriate and behaviour it, when you need a score? Well, no, I think you're obliged <laughs> to manipulate the situation emotionally or any way you can. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's what he was doing. And so he needs a seven. It wasn't a seven. But upon reflection of the heat... He probably won the heat. There's no... Well, just on the surfing, even on the worst waves, the surfing was so good that it was almost like the judges had exactly the situation you're talking about where they're kind of like Jackson Baker, Felipe Toledo, uh, do, do we give it to... And, and in the end, it was kind of... In my mind, I felt like they went, well, Felipe has to win the heat. The way he surfed, how good he surfed, even though he wasn't on the, the best waves, let's give him the score. He got the seven, won the heat, and it was a really sort of, not controversial, but interesting moment to watch because it was exactly what you were talking about. The judges were in that position where they could mm. go either way, and based on the overall surfing of the, the heat, the general performance level of both surfers, you couldn't deny Felipe. He was rip. He was surfing that good. So they went, yep, Felipe, you're on, and gave him the score, and he got through. And it was one of those situations that you were referring to where they, last minute, last ride, let's make a decision. And really, they got that one right for sure. Similar heat with Ryan Callanan and Felipe. Felipe was riding the small waves. Yes. And finally, the judges were so happy, I think, that Ryan did that backside air 360, and they were able to just push him through. But Felipe wasn't catching sets. You got that yeah. queued up? That one right there is what I was going to talk about. Okay. Why does he do this? Why does Felipe catch the smaller waves? Because he doesn't need to. He surfs so good, and he may be the only surfer on tour. Currently. Slater used to be able to do that. Slater yeah. used to be able to catch average waves and win heats. And on our, in our touring days where we were going to Manly and Bondi and Huntington, I could do the same. Right. You know what I mean? Small waves were my forte and I knew I could fit in stuff and do stuff and the worse it got, the better I feel. And that's about my chances. And Felipe's in exactly that situation. A tour that ends at lowers. He goes, well, that's a given. given. Thank you. Um, and so he, he was surfing so good, but there, that backhand air, in that semi-final, Ryan Callanan, that was an important moment in a career, an important moment in qualifying, an important moment generally for a goofy footer in one to three foot right hand point break waves with chop and lump and rib in them against Philippe Toledo. You know what I mean? It was the impossible mission and everybody's looking at Felipe going, well, this could be you know, back to backs, he could win this again. Um, and... That backhand air was miraculous. Nice first turn, came into that section, could have easily just hit it, but he threw everything at it, landed it perfectly, rode out of it perfectly and went on to rip that wave to shreds, win the semi-final, make the final, and that was a courageous underdog moment. You know what I mean? That was one of those moments that I love in pro surfing when the underdog, the, the guy of less reputation, manages to find a level within himself that you know he has, but to find it in competition and at that particular moment, it's not easy to do. And he did it and it, he's deservedly won that semi and, and maybe the lesson for Felipe in there is, mate, start getting on the good ones as well because at some point... Your performance on a lesser quality wave is not going to be enough against someone who's even closer to your ability on a better wave. So long term, there were good lessons in that from Felipe. And then the signs for Ryan Cannon into the final was, uh, was gold. Love that. I think uh, Ethan Ewing is going to be the darling of the judges now. You know how the momentum kind of shifts? Yeah. It was like Jack Robbo had that for a while. And now, unfortunately, with this injury pulling out of West Oz, they might adopt a new uh, golden calf. 
<laughs> Speaking of calves, have you seen those? Uh, but uh, yeah, Ethan Ewing. Mate, Ethan is um, Mick Fanning good mm. on the way face. So smooth, so fast, beautiful style, searing turns. Everything he does is of consequence. He never looks rushed. But everything has impact and power and and the size of the manoeuvres that he was doing, even on those one to three foot rink on uh, Winky Pop walls, was like, wow, mate, that was that was really incredible surfing and he is in an amazing place. And then you think about it, his mum, Helen Lambert, um, a maiden name, passed away, but she won Bells Beach in 1983. Were you there? No. I was there in 1983. Yeah, I do. I remember his mum, but I don't particularly remember that win, and I didn't particularly remember that that win was his mum until it became this story, and you thought 40 years later, he's grown up with that bell in his bedroom, sitting there, his mum's bell, and then 40 years later... And, and his mum has passed on, and he gets to, to, to ring that bell, win it 40 years later. His dad was on the beach, and his dad's a wonderful, you know as well as yeah. I do, very calm, very quiet. You wouldn't even know his dad's there, would you? He's a really sort of he gentle he guy. He doesn't whistle. No, he doesn't whistle. He's not, <laughs> he's not engaged. Or in, he's there as a father supporting his kids. And it was just, I could see the tears in his dad's eye. And, and that made that win extra special. Winning Bells is amazing. 60th anniversary of the event. Incredible. And then to think 40 years later or before that, your mum won it. She's passed away and you get to replicate that and have your own bell in your room to sit next to mum's a beautiful thing. Makes you want to cry. It's wow. amazing. So big props, Ethan Ewing, and in incredible form. You said it too. Jack Robbo has officially announced he's pulling out of Margaret River, the defending champion. He's in his heat against Xavier Huxtable, a young kid from that area, a past blast-off champion, great surfer. We knew when he won the under-8s and under-10s at blast-off that he was going places. And now all these years later to see him out there against Jack, he gets the score he needs. Jack attempts this, you know, just it's a last-minute, last-ditch effort. There's no chance he's getting the score. And in that moment of kind of almost surrender but relaxed He's relaxed in the body. It doesn't have the focus of someone really who believes he can get the score at that point because he wasn't on that wave. It was pretty obvious by the quality of the wave. Tweaks the knee and now has to put up with this recovery and, and he says he'll be back for the next event. Let's have a quick little read of this. During my heat at Bells, I ended up injuring my meniscus, the cartilage in my knee. After reviewing with a few specialists and discussions with my team, I'll be pulling out of the Margaret River Pro, which has got to hurt. That's his home beach, his home break. He lives there. As you all know, Margs is my home break, and I'm always looking forward to being in Western Australia. Unfortunately, I won't be able to compete at Margs, but it's what's best for my recovery and long-term goals. He'll be starting physiotherapy but he's confident of being back for the next event. So it can't be, it doesn't need surgery, which is a great thing, but so unfortunate. But maybe a little maybe a little slow down to the tempo and the pace of your year at this point in time. You've proven your point. You know how to lead. You know how to win. You hand the yellow jersey over to Jal Chianka. Congratulations to him. Parabangs, amigo, that is amazing. That guy deserves it as well. And for him to go from... Not make this time last year, he didn't make the cut. He was off the tour, went back to the Challenger Series and responded in the way champions do to that hardship. He didn't sit around moping, feeling sorry for himself, like we've, you know, we've talked about that cut and everyone knows how we feel about it. And we're not even going to mention it so much today and talk about who's at risk and who's this and all of that stuff because we don't want to really merit the cut with our time and attention. But um, to see Jao bounce back and be leading the world after a win in Portugal, Jack's unfortunate 17th at Bells, takes the yellow jersey and will take that into Margaret River. Congratulations to him. And let's uh, wish Jack Robinson a speedy recovery as well because the tour needs him in there to, to, to keep that race alive. Such a shame he has to miss that event of all events. All events. At home. I, but, and then in, in that sense, you've almost got to see the irony in it. But it, it makes... Two throwaways in uh, Margaret River and Bells Beach. They're both throwaways after an incredible start. So this will be a massive challenge for that young man to see how he bounces back 
after this injury and, and goes into you know the second half of the year. But like he said in his, his text, it's a long year, we're only getting started. So true enough. Cool. Righto. Um, the ladies tour. We mentioned um, the winner was... T- no, let's start that again. Yeah. And uh, then on to the ladies. In the ladies tour, is there anybody that was a uh, former Blastoff participant? There was. Molly Pickling, <laughs> yellow jersey, there leading the world. Yeah. Pickles, as they call her. She is in incredible form. She made the final there, only losing to Tyler Wright. Tyler Wright going back-to-back, Bells Beach titles. She's you know, sponsored by Rip Curl. You can feel the love and the connectedness that she has with the people and the wave and that area suits her surfing. And she looked dominant the whole way, you know. It was a powerful win by her. Molly Picklam, though, she was in great form, still in the yellow jersey, so leading into Margaret River still. So carrying that yellow jersey doesn't seem to bother her at all. I don't know if you've seen interviews with her and media bits. She's an articulate young lady. She's bubbly. She's got such character and personality that that she feels like you're listening to a champion and someone who's not at some point going to go, oh, the pressure of the... Oh, it's too much and crumble. Mm. You know what I mean? She feels so comfortable in that position and when I watch and listen to her and the way she carries herself... She's got champion written all over and she could very well go all the way this year and win the world title, especially given the success that she had last winter here in Hawaii. Winning the Vans, winning Sunset. So, you know, at both of those two venues, she's proven that she's got that as well. So, incredible. Congratulations to both those people, Tyler Wright and Molly. Stephanie Gilmore had a good event. Yeah, it was nice to see. Yeah, you saw her. She was in threat of the cut. Mm. And um, she needed a result and she bounced back and surfed like the champ she is. And then speaking of champions, the story's going to be at Margaret River. The media attention, the whole thing's going to be around Kelly Slater and whether he makes the cut. It's a big deal. He's a couple of spots outside. He's not making the cut today. If it ends today, he doesn't make the cut. And Kelly Slater falling victim to the cut is going to be the media's primary focus for those opening rounds. It's going to be interesting to see the way Kelly deals with that. You and I have spent some time with him. And I think it's fair to say that while he still loves competing, kind of, um, he doesn't necessarily love the attention as much as one used to. You know what I mean? It's kind of like... Uh, and I suppose that the attention comes for the wrong reasons. It doesn't feel as good. Right. And, and this is going to really expose WSL. I mean, they were begging for the cut. They, they told us their reasons, uh, supposedly, was to draw attention to it. But is the attention worth losing so many surfers off the tour? And creating... <laughs> as I Duh. Have, I, <laughs> I had it put to me, hooks. The hooks that we have created. Oh yes, are we working. need storylines. Why would you need a storyline when you have like the official ladder sponsor of the event, Bailey Ladders? I mean, there's your storyline. Somebody sold a ladder sponsor. That is the story. Get that salesman on the line. <laughs> Well, How did you convince though. Bailey Maybe. Ladders to invest in the tour? Why do you need to cut Kelly Slater when you've got <laughs> Bailey Ladders? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I love There's your hook with his hat. Yeah. So, I don't need to make fun of WSL when they make fun of themselves. You know, it's like, anyway, this cut, we know it's horrible. So this is a potential tragedy. Kelly Slater could have had an announcement, a swan song year. This is my last year on tour. Sign autographs, do special events at every mm-hmm. event. And now he might unceremoniously be gone. We know that uh, Margaret River's not a favourite place of his. He it has... should be. He's so good out there. Well, he's so good in anything, but I think he just needs to find the reason, doesn't he? There's those places that you kick, connect with and click with instantly. France was like that for me. First trip there, you win the event and you go, oh, I love France, and you love France forever. And well, then somewhere you go to and you don't do well and you're like, oh, that's a bit of a hiccup, that spot for me. And, and they can't guarantee the box. No, they cannot, but uh, let's hope they do. Let's hope they get it because they have, they have been cursed. Four events in, they have been mm. skunked every location they have been to. Those locations have been firing in the lead up to the event and then you know, the event starts and the conditions have been very poor. So even, you know, Bells was, you know, for Portugal, what do we call that out of ten? A three? Three. And Bells was a three out of ten too. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it's, the, you know, the potential of those waves are very incredible. There was one afternoon that was firing. They were running the women's down at Winky Pop. 
Bells was as good as I've seen it in the three to six foot range. I've never seen it better. The bowl was just cranking. Everyone was out there surfing. The contest was at, at um, Winky Pop. And it seems that they no longer consider Rincon as a, an option for the event at all. So it goes small, they'll go to Winky. And I don't know about you, but I find Winky a little boring. The wave itself, it's just off bottom. It's the same wave, same thing stands up. You see the same thing. Occasionally you get an air and it makes it exciting. Bell's Bowl is a challenging wave to surf. On the high tide when it's smaller, you've got Rincon, which has you know, long been used and a lot of titles have been won at Bell's. I won mine there in 91 on Rincon. It's a hard wave to surf, but it's a super long wave. I've seen and some of the best waves ridden on the Rincon section. I can think of Medina waves. John John waves that John John air over Medina and it's like that wave pulse is so good for modern surfing too. it's so long and you get so much variety and you get to watch the performance where Bells is I mean Winky Pop is that three turn combo judges love it that's it and if you ride your wave longer there's more than three your scores most probably going down because they just want it to stay big and that was that was the big learn for for Carlos over there was if your wave starts like this and goes like that your score will not go anywhere. If the wave starts like this and goes like that, you're, they're the ones you want. So you're really looking for the closeouts that the stand closeout. up and give you the wall and you get two or three big hits. Bells or Rincon is a completely different style of wave, but it takes great surfing to be able to put on the performance there. And I'd love to see them use it more because when they go to Wink, Winky Pop, the public are... They're completely... Shut out. Shunned. Yeah, and they sit on the concrete in the car park and watch a screen, which they could do at home, and they can't see the competitors. You can't get near anything at, at Winky Pop. So it really kills the vibe of the event and the festivities that are that Easter classic um, when they run at Winky Pop. And this year they ran there a lot, so it sort of limits that engagement with the public. And I'd love to see WSL... Think about the public, think about the spectators more than the surfers and allow that show to evolve and that public engagement to really take the, the, the event to the next level because the surfing's always great but some of the choices along the way sort of exclude the public and are more leaning towards the surfers. Like when they run at 7am and by 9.30 when people are getting there the event's over. <laughs> you know what I mean? You see those type of days. So I feel like... While it's fantastic, WSL have prioritised the surfers and think so much about them. And at the same time, you're a business, you're entertainment, and you need to think about your viewer and your audience and tailor a little bit what you're doing to them to make the spectacle what it really can be. Well, like you said, they wouldn't have been sacrificing wave quality. They would have got better waves. But, of course, there's yeah. a lot of trouble when they move the event one way or the other. I guess they're not set up. and they It's need a to big move deal yeah. to move it. Oh, also, massive. those people that you talk about sitting on the pavement paid $25 to get in. That's the other side of the coin. <laughs> Carlos was like, what, they got to pay? Yeah, okay, pay. Yeah, mate. He's like, oh, the really? they got to pay? It's wow. like going to the beach in New Jersey. Let's have a look here. Jack Robbo got him. Jao. Um, rink on no more. 1991, who won bells for the men's? Uh, some bloke who looked a lot younger than he does now. <laughs> and what board were you writing? I was riding a Thornton Philander. Thornton Philander, Thornton who I know Philander from thruster. watching him backside at Padang Padang. Yeah, and, and, and then the, the old Nias, the big roundhouse yes. cut back at oh. Nias. That was like, was that Storm Riders or one of those movies? It was like a classic, beautiful, that was like a legendary wave. And he made, you know, he made the board I was riding. And What uh, was the brand name on the board? Aloha? Were you Aloha Brothers then? Nielsen. Brothers Nielsen. Yeah, back with Brothers Nielsen. That was the the, the logo was like a badge, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was cool, mate. That was Big stickers? And then I think I won the US Open on the same board. Were you instinct at that time? Uh, uh, no, I think this was post-instinct. I think I was just Brothers Nielsen at this point in time. 91, was that near the end of your career? or the Well, 97 was the last year, okay. but it pff, may as well have been. So middle, way. 91. The way we behaved. How much did you win? Um, I can't remember. Still have no the money? <laughs> you always had no. The money was gone by that night. <gasps> oh, mate. Did you win a car? No, but I have won two. Before. Wow. Do you yeah. still have one, your one bell? Of them, one of them I sold and the other I drove till it died. Where's your bell? Yeah, bells are in storage in Sydney. I've got in my bells. In storage in Sydney. Yeah. Because I made a final with Damien Hardman as well. 
he and I had the 91 final together, Duma and I, and then he and I were in the final again in 93 maybe, and he got me okay. at Janja. So you got so, a big bell and a little bell. Yeah, I got a, yeah. and I think there might have even been a year where you might have got a little wooden one for third, and I might have a couple of them too. Wow. So there's a few, few bells in the cupboard. Love the bells. They're, they're everyone's most probably the, the, the favourite trophy. Jerry Lopez surfboards, of course, at the pipeline. Right. But um, the bells is one of those trophies that people When you won cherish. pipe, what did you get? What was your trophy? Was money? Or did you get I the, don't even know. If you I didn't get, get the headdress, right? No, we didn't get the headdress. That was when it was Marui. This was... Yours yeah, was a Billabong? Billabong Pro. I can't remember, mate. Or maybe there's a Billabong Pro trophy as well. Yeah, but maybe not a, a surfboard. No, no, not a surfboard. or Just a trophy. But as a kid... That was my favourite thing. I surfed contests for trophies. I would go up and go, is there a trophy? <laughs> they go, there's money. I go, no, no, but is there a trophy? I do remember going and, and you Love would kind of sneak over and look at the trophies. Yes. You know, just to yes. see them all glistening and shining. Like, I'm getting one of those. I'm getting one of I those. remember all these amateur contests. They had trophies all the way down to sixth place. Yeah. I mean... What was the point? You well, know? it's encouragement. It's encouraging so. the kids, and you get that trophy, and it means I've got boxes of them at home, literally boxes and boxes of trophies. Really? Yeah. I could never come to separate myself from that achievement. Maybe my ego is just so entrenched in my well, Your existence. trophies are a little better. When you have a bell <laughs> trophy. I'm talking about the amateur ones. There's just too many of them. I've got pro junior ones, the Mickey Mouses. When you used to get ceramic Mickey Mouses with waves, they were special Why Mickey trophies. Mouse? Because it was the, the icon of the, the original pro juniors all had Mickey Mouse kind of symbols in their, the logoing of those events. Mm. The very first pro juniors when there was that one at Narrabeen. There was only one ever in the year and people would come from everywhere to go in that thing and winning that was like winning the junior world title. That was the junior world wow. title, you know. And so I've even got them. I've got them all. I never threw a trophy out. <laughs> and somewhere along the line, my kids will open up that storage shed and open it up and there'll be all this amazing memorabilia and old stuff that yeah, they're just going to cool. trip on. It's going to be amazing. So I love all that stuff. I've kept all that stuff. So 91, you're on a Brothers Nielsen. How big is the board? How thick? Six tree, bro. Six three. Yeah. That's what I used to ride. Six three was my normal board. How thick? Chunky kind. That thing had big, held the thick. Two and three two quarters. And two, two and three eighths. Two and three eighths, but, yeah, yeah. but, but thick just out under to two the and a half. But hold flat decks. I hated that dome deck because you felt like you were on top of something. Mm. A flat deck actually made you feel like you were in the thing, driving it like a Ferrari. So always flat decks out to the rail with big face in that rail. So when you load that rail up against the wave's power with your power, you'll get... <laughs> I laugh because my power. Um, you load it up and you drive it against that wave and it's coming back at you and that's your accelerator and um, face in the rail is your friend. And I Try don't feel fin? like... Yeah, yeah, that was a thruster. Yeah, 91, we'd already been there for a little while. Glass on? Glass ons, yes, they were glass ons. What kind of leash? Balin? <laughs> no idea, mate. No idea. 91. 91. What the we fins were glass ons, though, for sure. Yeah, yeah, glass ons for sure, those ones. What's your deck pad? I always love the glass ons. And then the front the full deck gorilla grip. Now, not a lot of people had the front. You know, I, I, yeah, no, well, the front deck was. I suppose we were the, the first were. people. We yeah. were the pioneers of the front deck. And I didn't wax a surfboard for a decade. Wow. Never waxed a board. Because I, I had the th grip all the way. And then sometimes I just put it in front of the front grip pad just to put my feet on and rub into the wax before you, you know, start your heat. Now, I but wonder, I didn't wax my deck grip either because now I see that a lot. That's weird. Deck grip that they wax over the top. That drives of. me crazy. What is that? What are you doing? Waxing <laughs> your grip. What is it? Your grip's so good, you have to wax it. <laughs> what do you got it for? To me, there's oils in wax, and it would just make it slicker. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Okay, it's so like, Gorilla yeah, Grip, was it your own model? This? Was it the Barton Lynch model? Yeah, of course it was. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was my own model. That was the second generation of my own model. The first was the 3D, you know, the three dials, yeah. and then the second one. I'm going to find a picture, but what color was your board? It was clear. 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 I think the, and the Brothers Nielsen was a green with a red little, little logo on it. And uh, it was a good board, mate. That was one of them boards that never felt incredible. Well, I went, this is the best board ever. Those but are the best every, boards, though. Every it wave. It just does everything. Every wave, all the yep. way. Sh 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 never catch. Sh 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 done. It Ooh. doesn't need to be a superstar. No. It just needs to be there for you. And if you're turned on, it's turned on. That's, that's the way a board should feel, and if you, I think. And if you get the right waves and put that board mm -hmm. in your... your High third gear performance onto that wave. You know what it's going to do. You know it's a score. Okay, quickly. Yes. How much money 
total in contracts add up all those stickers on your board were you making in 91? Oh, no, I don't think I had many stickers. Around that stage, towards the end of my career, I only had Brothers Nielsen um, and the instinct thing had finished. They'd gone broke and, and left owing me money, so I was on a negative there. And Brothers Nielsen, I think I was maybe making... twenty five, six hundred grand a year? Tw 24 grand. 24 grand a year? Ex-World Champ. How were you getting to events? I was literally... There was a point where I realised, shh, my career's nearly over... I don't own a house. I have my half of the house here. I don't own a house in Australia. I don't own a car. I've got nothing and my career's nearly over. I've lost interest. I better get going, mate. I've got to get to work. And so I went back onto the QS, and did the QS, won it. I think it was 93 I won the QS as an old bloke. And I was doing QSs and CTs every event I could. I was hitchhiking to them. You were doing sleep. contests to literally make money? Make money. I was sleeping on couches, bumping in on car rides, I was saving every single cent I could, banking every cent I could, got the deposit, bought the house in Avalon and, and salvaged what I thought was my career. I was like, oh, at least we got a house out of this thing. Even, you know, we got a mortgage, but at least we bought a house. Yeah. And, um, and so that was, they were really tough years at the back end there without sponsors and it was kind of indignant a little bit, you know, you kind of... But we see those surfers on tour. You know, and they're great surfers and they've got no stickers on their boards. And, and I've done that. I've lived that. I understand what that feels like. And the, it gives you that underdog spirit, mate. You're the underdog. You're going to go out there and fight the golden children and take what's theirs and win that event and make some money to feed your family. And that's how, you know, my last bunch of years on tour were. They were that way with no sponsors and um, doing it on prize money. And that's when I, when I went, hey... The only th I remember a morning... So instead of swinging a hammer, you were swinging a board. Yeah, 100%. And there was a morning where I was sitting on my veranda um, in the partying days, and I'd been up all night. <laughs> and I was sitting there on the veranda, and the sun's just come up, and the kookaburras are going... <laughs> and you're going, wow, man, shut up. You give me a headache. No, no. And, and I realised, I went, whoa, the thing I care the most about, I'm just hooking for dough. The only reason I surf is for money. And the thing that I love the most, I'm prostituting and I'm just doing it for money. It's the only reason I do it. And it was, I went, and that's when I stopped. I quit competition at that moment in time, that morning on my veranda. I went, I quit. We've got to get a job. We've got to go find something else to do and, and find a, a new life for ourselves. And that's for another episode. How did Barton find a life? <laughs> and then Bells Reach had a few other... You know, built into the 60th anniversary, mm. there were other parts to it that were special in their own way. Owen Wright, surfing his last heat at Bells there, surfed his very first heat at Bells there as a Rip Curl sponsored grommet. And I remember seeing him at an Aloha Hornet event, South Curl Curl, he's 10 years old or whatever, and I went, wow, that's the best surfer I've seen since Mick Fanning. And that was exactly what I thought went, wow, that kid is incredible. He's the best surfer I've seen since Mick Fanning. So, Owen Wright, congratulations, mate. An incredible career. Perfect heats, two of them back-to-back. -back, winning Chopu's incredible pipeline performances on the way to his brain injury. At that point in time, he was one of the very best out here, yep. one of the best in the world uh, before the injury. The comeback from the injury into winning snapper. Insane. Ah, that was magic, mate. That's, that magic moments. Through to a bronze medal. At the Olympic Games. And you go, well, smashing career, mate. So Owen Wright's last heat down there, get to watch him surf. He was in incredible form. Um, he surfed great. He surfed really good. And in the free surfs around the event, he was amazing. And I was like, woohoo, he's in, I think a micro said it was A, plus, like the best form of his career. So he was surfing great. People loved it. The public loved it. And um, much respect, to Owen Wright. Great way to finish your career, and there's plenty more to come. The best days are in front of you, as we will attest to. And then the other thing, got an old bloke pretty excited, was the heritage heat. Why weren't you in it? Oh, because it was Curran and Oki. Yeah, it's a classic matchup. And it's a classic, and I remember the original, mate. That original heat, Curran and Oki, was whew, next level good. And it was one of them heats that stood the test of time, still is one of the great heats of all time. They went, went at it again, and... Um, you could see some obvious things to me, a little stickiness in Curran's board, really fast in a straight line. 
across the flats and through the deads. Was like, whoa, look at that board. I think it was but, the fins or the yeah, it was those board. fins. When he when he went to get on a rail, you could see all that rake and all that fin back there, kind of holding things back and then twanging a bit, but not with a smooth fluid. It didn't feel. It didn't was release. fast. Yeah, it didn't release. It was fast, it was clean, but it didn't release, and I didn't feel like it allowed him to do his very best surfing. No, but at least he rode a surfboard and not a skimboard. That's exactly right. We were happy about that. And then Ock, the first few rides, I was like, ooh, this is humbling. A few fall-offs, and you know how that feels, and you say, go, oh, come on, Ock, get it together. And he did. You know, he got a decent one all the way through, and then he got that one big hook, and the judges loved, gave him an eight, and he won the heat, but who cares who won it? Right. It was just good to see two champions back at it, and I think the Heritage Heats bring so much value to an event, and a best of three round-robin format through the window would be an amazing thing, but congrats to both those guys. Yeah, uh, definitely that was Rip Curl putting that together, not WSL. Right. We'd like to see more Heritage Heats uh, at the right time in the right place, you know, something in the mental wise. Who would your matchup be? Well, I've had one heritage heat. At we we want Beach. it to be an Aussie versus a Seppo because that's such a classic yes, matchup. Yes, that's always a good one. You and Gurr? Yeah, we never had such no. a big rivalry. I don't know we had that many heats together. Did you I have mean, any me rivalries? and Potts, oh, Potts. Potts and I had massive rivalry. Really? Me, Tom Carroll. But those meets, are your friends. Yes, exactly. Now. You, oh, you weren't super now, good friends with Potts on tour? No, mate. We were, we were arch enemies. Really? We Trying to occupy the same space other. kind of thing? Yeah. And his manager, Peter Manstead, oh, that's right. was my me. past manager. Right. And I left because I could see the writing on the board and knew <laughs> the guy's a wanker. And Potts didn't see that and understand that till later on. Right. But we, 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 had, a, we had some doozies, Potts and I. Ock? Ock, Duma and Tom Carroll. And me, you know, those three goof, four goofies mm. that at the same time, that was a, that, that, there were some mighty rivalries. And mighty Can we heaps. just get the four of you to macaronis? That's what we did. Yeah, anyway. Settle the score? Well, you just need three hours at macaronis. <laughs> you know what? Settling the score is an interesting thing because you... There's no score to be settled. It'd be right. fun to go perform. But that's what it is. It's you know, the performance yeah. and being able to go out there and put on a show and... You know, try and get India surfing well, is such a great thing. I think the best part of those things, too, is it just re-references that great era. Yeah. And you get to kind of watch that and then see everyone again and high five. It's a, it's as much of a contest as it is a reunion, right? And, and, and you see the impact on the surfer. Oki was there every morning. Really? Early. <laughs> every morning. And surfing a lot. Curran, by his standards, was there a lot. He's not normally you wouldn't even see him. Yeah. But he was there down on the rocks getting, you know, and I saw him surfing a few times. And so both of them recognised the magnitude of the moment, the situation. You don't want to go out there and... You don't want to embarrass yourself. Oh, it's a, there's a lot to lose in those heats too. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you want to go out there and put on a show. And I remember surfing the one against Duma at Bells Beach a few years back. And it was it's quite terrifying. Who won The that? whole situation. Oh, you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a pretty good heat, actually. Got a 7.83 on the first one. And then backed it up with an 8.83. Wow. They and, score you guys high, and then huh? I co and then, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> score the old fellas high. V4 for a pro. <laughs> I've got an 8 for one turn. Really? Um, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. So, um, but they're good. It's a great thing. It makes you revisit, especially as a coach. And so that you was have a, to practice what you preach. But that was at Bells? Yeah. So it seems like it's Rip Curl that's it's pushing that. Yeah, and I suppose Bells is a historic venue. Well, it's Rip got Curl, the richness of 60 years in it, right? Yeah, it's a great venue for it. Mm. And it could be a good wave, you know? Yeah. Um, so Rip Curl, they've, they sponsor a lot of events. I noticed they're sponsoring the finals. Maybe they could do something again. That's interesting, isn't it? The crowd it? does like those things. You could do one a day, you know, except that finals is only one day. So. That's, you know, you almost have a, you, you fit it week. into other days in the waiting right. period where you go, this isn't quite the day we want, but it's a great day for these old blokes. Oh, there you go. So they type Is anyone listening? Is anyone listening? Hello. It doesn't matter though, you know, I know, I know. we've had our day It too. is a fun thing to do though. Oh, I loved it. Great well, The audience loved it. I mean, I saw yeah. the chatter online and, and on social media. Everyone loved it. Yeah. You know? Well, so. they, they, and they, they, you know, those two have stood the test of time. Yeah. Haven't surf, they? surf fans are not all 13 years old and only know the current surfers. Surf now fans more do than ever. span a, a large age group, and they are, we are interested in the surfers we grew up admiring and looking at. So there's a lot of options for those heritage heats. Yeah, and those guys, um, the kids you're talking about, they've got mum and dad who grew up with us. And they, they tell them, the kids, hey, that guy 
oh, is it good? That's a world champion right there, mate. And the kid looks at me and goes, what? <laughs> Santa Claus was a world champion? <laughs> what is going on no here? No way. <laughs> but, yeah, it was good vibes all around, you know. Bells Beach, Australia, Easter. Been doing that a long time, mate, since 1980. Wow. And uh, I've only missed a few of them, and uh, it was good to be back in Australia. Thanks to everyone for the love. And it was great to, um, you know, Chip in there with Carlos. He is now at Margaret River as we speak. I've tuned him in with Mitch Thorson there. The reason I'm not with him, so for clarity's sake, so people understand that, still in the camp, still working with him, but I'm off to the Maldives in a couple of days for a pre-COVID boat trip and land-based coaching trip that have been waiting three years to happen. Wow. Those dates were set in before I started working with Carlos, so I could never have gone to Margaret River. But we've set him up with Mitch Thorson there. Mitch and he are together now going to surf Maine break and um, I'll be tuning in with them and we will keep the, the, the momentum going and regardless of the results at Margaret River he'll go into that championship series and, and fight for his life to qualify for next year's world championship tour. Vai Carlos, give me one name that wins the men's and one name that wins the women's. At Margarechi Hiva. Yeah, let's gamble on it. Margarechi Hiva. one dollar. I'm going to bet you one dollar that John John Florence wins the men's. That's a pretty safe dollar. That's the safest dollar you could spend, mate. That's, that's It's his contest to lose. And he is in incredible form. At Bells Beach, John John Florence was ripping, mate. Boards looked amazing, so fast, so light underfoot. He was competing really well. And we kind of felt like Felipe John John. You know, you're like, well, there's, that, that could be the final. And with so, Jack out, you know, big mm -hmm. if it's... 10 foot, I mean, John John's just the best surfer in the world. Whether it's the box or main break yeah. on those rights, he redefined surfing those rights. He is the best surfer to ever surf the Margaret River right. And so he, I couldn't go past him for the men's. I'll pick Kelly. I love it. Yeah. And I would love that too. That'd be cool. That would be the best thing ever, mate, to see him go on. And, and in the face of all of the scrutiny and the eyes looking and wondering whether the, the king will fall to the mid year cut. Um, It'd be a great win. It'd be a great win. And it's going to take a lot of great surfing, a lot of great focus and some, some depth that he hasn't found in himself. He's been working his way to there. And in his first heat, you know, the one he got through mm. at Bells, I was like, oh, it's coming. You know, you could see that spark coming. So he's, he's building form into it. And this, although it's, you know, in the context of 34 years or whatever it is of a career, it doesn't really mean much. Cut, no cut. Make it, don't make it. But for him, and he's there, so he's trying. It's an important moment. Women's? Women's. One name. Oh, that's a... Stephanie Gilmore. I'm gonna cool. go. I'm gonna go with momentum out of bells into loving her momentum, getting through the cut, and people kind of supporting and, and having that... Love that they do for her. There is this grassroots energetic momentum to her always. Where, like, if, 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 some, if Gabriel Medina does it hard to get points, it feels like he's never been given one in his life, mm -hmm. I feel like Steph, she gets points. And if she's half her best, she'll get points. If she's at her best, she'll win. And so she's got to be at her best, but I feel like she's building momentum and, and there was some spark in things at uh, Bells Beach that I feel like we haven't seen this year yet. I'm going to say Carissa. She wants a win. And she, that's right. And she she's good there. She's in great form too. And, you know, I hate picking winners. I think that I whole know, thing I'm of just, picking winners It's sucks, just for fun. But yeah, just it's for just fun. for fun. Yeah. You know what else is going to be fun? What? I've been asked to commentate the ISA World Surfing Games in El Salvador in early June. So I get to get back in the commentary booth for the ISA. And, and those ISAs events. are usually 13, 14 days long, so that's good. There's a lot, 12, long, there's a lot long. of events, there's a lot of heats. El Salvador in June. And I've never been to El Salvador, so I'm excited Is to go there. Is this that right? Yeah. Where they had the I think WSL there's a couple event of them. last yes, year? Yes, correct. Surf City. And the WSL's not going there this and year. And what? Is Bitcoin the, the, the currency of the country? Is it's it their really? reserve currency. I love that. Uh, so we're excited to go to El Salvador. Thank you to the ISA for having me on the team. And uh, I can't cool. wait to call some heats, mate. I keep listening to webcasts. And I feel like I'm meant to be there. I hear <laughs> things and watch heats and see moments where I know what I'd be saying. And I go, oh, I need to be there. I well, should be calling these things. We're going to create a so, tour specifically for you to <laughs> announce. It's coming. All right, peoples. Thanks for visiting the Pipeline Studios with us. Massive thanks to A New Earth Project for the facility, for this fine fella, for all that he brings to the podcast. Thank you for sharing in the stoke that is our lives, and I look forward to catching up with you after the Maldives. We're going to be sharing some stoke from the Indian Ocean real soon.
Have a great one.